with um, Chris Linder, uh, who will be speaking on The Big Thaw, Ancient Carbon, Modern Science, and a Race to Save the World. Before we get started, I have a couple of uh, quick announcements. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet that's going to be being passed around. Please um, sign it. It helps us track attendance, and it also helps us let you know about future wonderful events. Uh, the King's English is out front with books, and Mr. Linder will be delighted to sign them for you after the talk. Uh, please turn off your cell phones. And most importantly, we have wonderful sponsors that we need to uh, acknowledge and thank and be grateful for. Uh, the Cultural Vision Fund and the University of Utah Credit Union. They provide funding for our lectures, our annual symposium, and our Young Scholar Program. Uh, the University Credit Union in particular is a sponsor of our 2019-2020 Green Bag series. Uh, so now to Chris Linder. Chris Linder is a professional science and natural history photographer. He's a former, former naval officer and oceanographer who now focuses on communicating the stories of scientists working in extreme environments. He's documented more than 50 scientific expeditions from the Congo to Siberia, and has spent over two years of his life exploring the polar regions. He told me that wasn't exactly just the pole, because the poles themselves are boring. It's the polar regions that are fantastic. Linder's images have appeared in museums, books, calendars, and magazines. A solo exhibition of his photographs exploring the Arctic seafloor was displayed at Chicago's Field Museum and at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History um, in New York. He's the author of Science on Ice, Four Polar Expeditions, and was the lead cinematographer for the documentary Antarctic Edge, 70 Degrees South. His work has won numerous awards from international competitions. He's been Wildlife Photographer of the Year, Nature's Best Photography, and International Conservation Photography Awardee. When not on assignment, he enjoys sharing his passion for photography by teaching workshops, giving presentations to audiences of all ages. He's a senior fellow in the International League of Conservation Photographers, a member of the Sea Legacy Collective, and a fellow national in the Explorers Club. Please join me in welcoming Chris Linder. Hey, thanks a lot for the, for the welcome and for inviting me uh, to come here to speak today. It was, um, it, was, it was taking me back a little bit when I was woken up by the sound of snow plows this morning because I grew up in southeast Wisconsin and I haven't heard that sound, that scraping sound, for a long time. And now I live in, in, uh, on the east coast uh, outside of D.C. and we don't ever hear that sound there. So that was a little bit of, of going back in time for me. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about this project, The Big Thaw, that's consumed my time for about, I started on this project in 2008, so it's been a long, long road for me to, from when I first started photographing this project to now finally um, putting all of these years of work into book format. Um, and um, so I have, you know, a lot, a lot of people um, that I could thank that made this all possible. Um, we have a fantastic writer, Eric Scigliano, that compiled kind of years of interviews with scientists and with the students that have been involved in the project and wrote this narrative that kind of ties everything together. Uh, the three lead scientists from the project, Max Holmes, Sue Natale, and John Shade, all wrote um, excerpts in the book. 
And of course, uh, the press, the Mountaineers press did a wonderful job in kind of collating all the photographs that I'd taken. I think about 150,000 photographs that I'd taken over the years, selecting the ones that were going to appear in the book and then producing a really, really lovely um, hardcover book at the end of the, at the, end of the day. And also, um, Theodore Roosevelt IV, the great grandson of President Teddy Roosevelt, wrote a, a nice epilogue. I actually met him last week at the Explorers Club when he introduced Max and I giving a talk there in New York City. And so um, tonight or today, I'm going to talk to you about kind of the long road that I had to get to creating this book and then walk you through my perspective as a photographer and how I photographed uh, this, this project, which is honestly one of the hardest projects I've ever, I've ever photographed in my career. Um, there's a lot of sentinel species that, that have been photographed, penguins, polar bears, to represent you know, the effects of a changing climate. But um, I decided to work on, on permafrost for this book, one, because it was a really important topic, and two, because um, it just wasn't being covered by anyone else. And, um, but it is challenging because the main components of this story are essentially frozen mud and invisible gases. So it was a, it was a tough sell. Um, and it took me a lot of years to, to, uh, to make the photographs to make this compelling story. Um, so a little bit about me. This is, these are my normal work clothes. So about you know, 180 or so days of the year, I look like this. Um, I photograph 50 scientific expeditions. Um, but my original background was in oceanography. And so I am, or even going back before that, I was in the Navy, I was a lieutenant in the Navy, uh, and uh, only picked up a camera in my mid-20s when I was stationed in southern Spain, working as a uh, weather, weather officer for the Navy and uh, forecasting weather for the Mediterranean fleet. And it was there that I kind of fell in love with photography. Every weekend I would go out with my camera and photograph um, festivals, I'd go out into the mountains hiking, chase ibex around the mountains, and, and, uh, and really fell in love with photography. And then after that, I came back to Woods Hole Oceanographic after my commitment was up, my service commitment. And I started working as an oceanographer at Woods Hole Oceanographic, going to sea on research vessels like this one. This was one of the roughest expeditions I'd ever been on, um, the Gulf Stream. In the middle of winter, we were, we were on a small converted fishing trawler um, battling 15 to 20 foot waves. And half the equipment broke by the end of the cruise. Um, but we were tracking water masses. Um, off the uh, what they called the graveyard of the Atlantic off Cape Hatteras for a couple of weeks. And that was, this is more or less the kind of work that, that I was doing as an oceanographer. And what, um, what happened on, that, on these expeditions was as I was going out and doing the work, like wrangling these heavy instruments over the side, bringing them back on board, um, using MATLAB, a computer program, to download and analyze the data, in my off hours, I was using my camera to document the science, and that was something that nobody else really had an interest in or was doing. And so I became known at the institution for being the person that could not only kind of handle the science aspects of the cruise for the watch standing, but also to take pictures and to document. And so increasingly over the years, scientists would come to me. This was kind of a gradual transition that I made from from, photo, from doing the science to being the person that would document the whole cruise. And, and uh, my projects expanded over the years and took over more and more of my life. I got to visit some truly remarkable places in polar regions, camped on the Greenland ice sheet here for two weeks in the middle of summer, working with researchers that are studying um, the meltwater that's forming on top of the glaciers. I've also worked on a big river chemistry project that took me to all the big rivers in the world from this is a little tributary of the Congo in the Congo Basin, to the Amazon, to the Orinoco and the Mekong. And lastly, I've photographed the submersible Alvin in the Gulf of Mexico. This was a project that I did a couple years ago after the Alvin got upgraded. And uh, the common theme amongst all these projects is that I will use my photography to embed with science teams and to tell their stories because often these science teams are super, super busy when they're in the field. They don't have technical expertise to do their own photography, but they have amazing stories to tell. And so that was where I found my niche is to tell the stories of what the scientists were doing in a way that kind of translated their complex science into a medium that everybody could understand, the medium of, of photography. And so after this large, I had a two-year project that culminated in another book called Science on Ice that was focused entirely on the polar regions. I got introduced to this 
amazing scientist, Max Holmes, who is the lead uh, scientist for the, the Big Thaw project or book that I'm going to talk about tonight. Now, he's been described as kind of the Indiana Jones of river chemistry. He was also the lead scientist for this, um, the Rivers Project, the Global Rivers Project that I mentioned earlier that took me to the Congo and the Amazon. And when I met Max, he had just gotten a grant funded to bring, it was a new project to bring undergraduate students to the Arctic, specifically the uh, uh, Siberian Arctic, and to introduce these young undergraduates to Arctic system science and to let them develop their own research projects for a month at a time. And then at the end of that month, take their results and present them at scientific meetings and, and write their own papers and get them hooked on Arctic research. And so the first time I met Max, he said, well, I've got a project. Um, I'm going to Russia in March. Would you like to come along? And it was the first time we had met. Max is a very charismatic guy. And he convinced me that, that I should come with him with a small group that was going to visit a school where he had enlisted some of, the, some of the kids in the school to actually take measurements of the river water on the, on the Lena River for him while he couldn't be there. And so I went on this amazing tour with him for about a week and a half uh, through Russia. We were a guest of the local school here in, in Zhigansk. This is some of, the, some of the young kids who put on a show for us while we were there. Um, but it started, had kind of an inauspicious start. In order to get there, uh, we were supposed to fly from this town called Yakutsk up to Zhigansk, and the flight was canceled because of a big storm. And so we decided, in order not to waste any time, we would hire a local driver to drive the ice roads up to Zhigansk. And so this is our driver actually consulting a map, a topographic map of eastern Russia that Max had bought at the map store in Yakutsk. At one point, we were, uh, we were a bit lost. There were a number of times when he fell asleep at the wheel and drove into snowbanks, and we had to push the little, the little van out. Um, we were running out of gas at another point, and he had to barter cigarettes for more gas, but eventually we made it to Zhigansk, and that was just the start of our adventures. Um, and this was my introduction to Russia, and it was, it was minus 20 degrees. I had contracted a stomach bug on the way through Moscow, and I was not feeling great, but it was just incredible adventure. Um, while we were at the school, some of the local people had offered to take us to see um, some local um, reindeer herders and to see what they do and how they live their lives. And of course, we jumped at the opportunity. We rode on these snowmobiles up into the taiga forest all day and got to spend the night with a local family here at their log cabin, kind of deep in the, in the taiga forest. And the next morning, I had one of the most incredible photo shoots of my life. Spent a couple hours with them as they literally drove the snow machines out onto this frozen lake and I remember distinctly a driver took out this wrench and he just banged on the snow machine. And I said, well, what's going to happen next? I don't know what's happening here. And then all of these reindeer came out of the forest and surrounded us. And that was a cue to them. that They were going to get some salt. Um, and, and then they proceeded to the, this young boy who was part of, the, uh, part of the family. He was probably 11 or 12 years old, rode this reindeer bareback uh, with a makeshift harness and a stick for balance. They drove the reindeer across the lake and into this makeshift pen, and, and, uh, and they corralled the reindeer, and then this herder just opened his hands in this gesture of appreciation, and it became um, one of the best pictures I'd ever taken in my life. And that was the start of my Siberian adventures. And after that trip, um, I think Max and I learned a lot about each other. Max learned that I was very, uh, very hardy, and I could last, and I could survive. And in Siberia, it was a rough trip for me, being really, really sick and it was minus 20 to minus 40. And I learned that Max was a tremendous, tremendously devoted individual to his science, and I was hooked on the idea of storytelling with him in conjunction with his work. And so that began um, the start of you know, this 10-year project. I think I spent a total of 167 days in the field just photographing this project, so that was the most I've ever shot one single project. So just to give you an idea of where, um, where the project's based, um, the first years of the project were based in eastern Siberia, so on the, on the Kolyma River, which is one of these big Arctic rivers that drains into the Arctic Ocean. And over uh, in the last few years of the project, the field camp has shifted to a, a camping expedition to the yukon Kuskokwim Delta in Alaska. So these are the two locations. And I want to start uh, by introducing you to what this area is like, because people have a lot of, when I say, you know, for example, I'm going to the Arctic, 
for the summer. A lot of people have some preconceived notions of what that's going to look like. They think, oh, are you going to get eaten by polar bears, or is it going to be really cold? And, uh, you know, it's not, where we were going, it's not really the case. In fact, the Arctic is an extremely diverse environment with a lot of diverse in, um, ecosystems. So it, the starts, you know, the area where we're mainly based in Chersky is in the Taiga Forest. And we're above the Arctic Circle by a little, little bit, a couple degrees, and so the sun never sets. This was shot at about midnight. The sun gets really, really low, kind of skims the trees. I would often find myself shooting landscape pictures late into the night in order to capture that low angle sunlight that photographers like. Um, but this was a big part of, of the environment there, the fact that in the summer there's 24 hours of daylight. Um, you get these incredible weather events. This is, this is a full double rainbow which lasted for probably an hour because as the sun is skimming those trees, it's not really setting. It just kind of goes down low on the horizon and then pops back up. This is an old Soviet barge that was just abandoned on the banks of the Pantaleja River. Uh, this used to be uh, an area that was a gold mining town during the Soviet Union. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, they, uh, the town actually became very depopulated and uh, a lot of the infrastructure is just kind of rusting away there. This is a land that's dominated by large, large rivers. In Russia alone, there's the Ob, the Yenisei, the Lena, the Kolyma. These are all huge rivers the size of the Mississippi and they drain enormous tracts of land and they all deposit all of the things that, that go into them from the landscape surrounding them into the Arctic Ocean. So all of these rivers kind of feed into this, into this Arctic Sea to the north. In the fall, um, the taiga forest turns this beautiful golden color. Almost all of the trees in this area are Dahurian larch and their needles are, um, are actually, they turn this beautiful golden color. When I was photographing this, I was standing on the banks of this, of this pond. It's an extraordinarily swampy environment. Um, every step you take, it's, it's like you're standing on floating mats of vegetation. So literally, it's like standing on a waterbed. And you have to be very careful because any step you might take, you can, you can punch through that vegetation and go in up to your waist or farther. So you have to be really careful uh, because it really is just a giant, giant bog. There's a number of fascinating and beautiful and incredible creatures that make their home in the taiga forest from brown bears to great gray owls. This is a great gray owl chick that had come out of its birth tree and they typically spend a day or two on the ground before they fly back up um, to the branches near their nest. As you move farther and farther north, the climate becomes more and more inhospitable to life, especially to plant life. And as you can see here, this is the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta north of the tree line. The trees shrink until they disappear entirely, and all you're left with are these shrubs. You get uh, dwarf alder, dwarf willow shrubs, and, uh, but the landscape is still dominated by this ponds and rivers and, and little uh, boggy meadows. And from, the, from a distance, it looks like a big carpet of green, um, but as you get in closer, you see that it's actually this amazing mosaic of beautiful, beautiful plants and tiny flowers that are enjoying this amazing surge of life that happens and light uh, that happens in the summer when the sun never sets. And there's just an incredible um, plant life like this. This is Arctic cotton grass. So I got low here to emphasize, uh, emphasize the, uh, the backlighting on these, on these little tiny plants, but most of, the, most of them are just barely, you know, ankle high. But the lower you get, and I spend a lot of time on my hands and knees kind of looking for, for little species like this. This is an Indian paintbrush or a boreal paintbrush. Um, I was amazed by the diversity and, and, uh, and the beauty of these, of these plants that I found on the Arctic tundra. Um, there's other creatures that make their home north of the tree line. Arctic ground squirrels dig extensive burrows all throughout the tundra. Sandhill cranes will uh, raise there, and a lot of birds actually use the tundra area, particularly in the Yukon Kuskokwim area, um, to raise their, um, raise their chicks. They have, uh, they have an abundance of insects to eat while they're there. Um, this is probably the most, uh, most prevalent and least favored uh, creature that inhabits um, the tundra in the summer in the taiga forest. This is typical still day in, uh, in Russia in July. 
it makes it the hardest season in t to work in Russia or in, or in Alaska. This was probably an, uh, a, one of the worst days we had, but it wasn't unusual to take your hand and swat and kill 10, 10 to 15 mosquitoes each time you're swatting um, to the point where you just give up and you just learn to live with them and wear a head net. So, uh, you know, as a photographer, it's really difficult. You're basically shooting through uh, like a mesh screen for the whole time. Um, it's really hard to tell what's in focus and what's not. There's often bugs coating my lens. There's bugs coating all in my shots. A lot of times for the landscape photography that I did at night, I'd have to set up the camera, put it on timer, kind of step away from the camera and the cloud would follow me and then the camera would take a shot and I could go back to it um, because or else there were literally just clouds of bugs in front of the lens every time. So one of the, so that's, that's an introduction to kind of this environment that I was, that I was photographing. Again, you don't see any polar bears, you don't see any ice. This was um, the Arctic, the taiga and tundra environment in summer. Um, that's when we were taking students up there. This was uh, us loading the plane to go from Yakutsk to Chersky. Um, at the time I was living in Seattle and we had to go east to get to Chersky. That was 19 time zones we had to cross. So that was three back-to-back red-eye flights really from Seattle to New York, New York to Moscow, Moscow to Yakutsk, and then another three and a half hour flight on this plane to get to the small town of Chersky. And so that was, it's an incredible journey to get there. For many of the students, the undergrads, it was their first time leaving the country. And so it was quite an introduction into, uh, into traveling and logistics, Arctic logistics. And I, I generally don't show the students pictures like this until they you know, get there and experience it for themselves. Max had a great, in his introduction to the book, he wrote about, about travel and flying. And it says this wonderful quote that I thought I'd read to you from the book. So it's, Max writes, it's not hard to separate the optimist from the pessimist when standing on the tarmac in Yakutsk, Siberia. The optimist looks at the aging twin engine plane, our group of 25 undergraduate students and scientists is about to board for a four hour flight to Chersky deep in the Siberian Arctic and is comforted by its many decades of success at traversing one of Earth's most remote and inhospitable environments. The pessimist looks more closely at the battle scarred plane and shudders at the countless horrific ways that its good luck streak could end. And that basically sums up, <laughs> sums up this uh, unique travel experience that we had to go through. Um, but it was, there was a reason that we were coming 19 time zones east. There was this incredible scientific facility that was there. Even though, you know, it, it seemed like at times we were in the middle of nowhere um, on the banks of the Pantaleja River in, in Russia, um, we were the guests of Sergei Zimov, uh, a, sci a noted scientist who had developed a, a small research station there called the Northeast Science Station. It's basically him, a friend of his, Sergei Davidoff, and his son Nikita and their families. And uh, what he has is this great research facility um, where scientists can come and stay, and he would feed us and give us logistic support, like, like boats um, and drivers to take us where we needed to get to. And uh, most importantly is the amazing environment that surrounded this area um, that we got to work in. Sergei is best known for his, his landscape experiment project called Pleistocene Park, which you may have heard about. It winds up in magazines quite frequently. Anytime um, they bring up the idea of cloning a, cloning a woolly mammoth, um, Sergei is the one who says he already has a house for it on, on the tundra. Um, he's designed this, this, this experiment, Pleistocene Park, to be kind of a large-scale, big-thinking landscape experiment. He bought this plot of land fenced it all off and used a small tank to bulldoze the large trees. And what's he want, what he wants to do is recreate the tundra steppe ecosystem. So this area of Russia during the Pleistocene was all grasslands, very, very fertile, productive grasslands. It was home to all these mega herbivores um, like woolly mammoths, uh, woolly rhinoceros, or horse, this is the Yakutian horse, kind of an ancient, um, you know, kind of a modern, modern relative of that ancient horse. And nowadays, you know, he's taking um, and buying all of the, the herbivores that he can find to kind of recreate this tundra steppe ecosystem. He captures moose calves in the local area, brings them to the park. This is one of the park staff's children playing with the moose baby. And, uh, and what he's, it's, it's, um, it goes beyond just a, an experiment to say, can this be done? But he's also taking a lot of measurements as to how that, 
introduction or reintroduction of that, of that grasslands ecosystem and what that does to the carbon budget in the soil. And, and what he's found is that the tundra steppe is actually much better at stabilizing the permafrost uh, than the kind of modern, boggy, swampy environment that it is today. Um, but it needs these mega herbivores, these grazers, to maintain the grasses. So there's this relationship between the animals and the grasses that's, that's symbiotic and, and critical to maintaining that ecosystem. And that's, he says, is the reason why that the, that the ecosystem has kind of transformed into the one that it is today dominated by, by bogs, is the lack of herbivores like this. And so this is one of the houses there at uh, one of the lab buildings where we work. Um, there's uh, mooses on the menu three times, three times a day, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, we have access to this vast network of rivers, which, you know, there's never a map, but every time we jump in the boat with Nikita or Murat or one of the drivers, off we go in one of these small aluminum boats, and they seem to instinctively know they've been living there for so many years just how to get to where we need to go. There's no roads beyond just getting from the airport to the science station or just for a mile or two around, around the town. It's really all based on rivers. And in the winter, when these rivers freeze over, they become the ice roads. It used to be, Chersky used to be a former, former military installation as well. There's a lot of infrastructure there that, you know, old satellite dishes, even old buildings that are crumbling and falling apart when the Soviet Union kind of pulled out of their investment in Chersky. Um, they're all going to waste. So Niki, uh, Sergei snapped them up like this, like this building, which actually becomes, had become a dormitory and a, and a lab for us. He called it Orbita. It's a former, he says it's a former TV station, so we're not exactly sure what that, what that means, but it has this giant, gigantic dish on top of it. And so, you know, we've taken, in 2014, we took the barge north to this, to this area of the tundra where we did some work. This is, this is the modern kind of Siberian landscape, and it's not, it's not the above above ground part of the landscape that the scientists are interested in, but really what lies beneath. Because 12 million years ago, 2.5 million to 12,000 years ago, I should say, this was a totally different environment, as I mentioned, with the grasslands dominated by grazers. Now it looks like this. And the Arctic, as it warms, is kind of transforming even how this landscape looks. It's becoming more boggy. There's an increase in the number of lakes because the permafrost uh, soil, which is all it is, is soil that's been frozen for more than one year, is really soil that's filled with ice and filled with carbon, carbon that's the remains of all these old plants and all these old creatures that lived millions of years ago. And as, that, as the Arctic warms, and it's warming faster uh, than the rest of the planet, uh, the ice that's within this soil is transforming, it's, it's, it's melting and thawing into water. And then it's becoming even more boggy. Trees like this are starting to lean and tip. You're seeing buildings in Yakutsk. Uh, the infrastructure is built on permafrost, which if you, if, you, if you touch and you knock on permafrost with a hammer, it, it sounds like cement. But as it thaws, it turns into basically pudding. So um, a lot of the buildings that were built on permafrost now have all sorts of infrastructure problems throughout the Arctic as a result. So the skin on top of the soil, which is like an orange peel, Kind of on top of an orange is this active layer, which is where the plants can get their roots into in the summer um, before it freezes in the winter. So every summer, this top layer of the soil is, um, is, uh, is, is you can dig it, you can put your hands into it. Um, it smells very, very earthy and, and, uh, and almost and peaty, you know, if you've ever smelled peat. But as you dig deeper and deeper, you get into this, this, this really hard ice-filled soil. This is a tunnel that the Zimovs dug throughout the Arctic. Well, many, many Arctic communities use the permafrost as a freezer, a natural freezer. So in the winter, they open the doors to these tunnels. They let in the minus 40 degree air. It freezes the walls solid. They store fish and meat down in these, down in these uh, cellars. And then in the summer, they shut the doors so that when the temperature rises above freezing, um, they trap all that cold air down in these permafrost tunnels. This is it's very difficult, actually, to get a photograph inside of, of one of these tunnels. The Zimovs had dug this one near Pleistocene Park, and it, I don't know how long it took them, but it was hand-carved. Hand it must have taken forever. One of the places that we visit to sample kind of permafrost and take water samples and soil samples is on the banks of the Kolomo River, this area called, um, called Devani Yar. 
and it's, it's an area where it's, it's thawing so fast that there's all these bones just coming right out of the soil. This is the bones that we collected in just one day's walking around the banks of the science team just walking around. It's so rich in carbon and in and fossil remains like this that, um, you know, it was, this is where a lot of the bone hunters actually come to try to find mammoth tusks. Obviously, the ivory is a big, uh, a big item that they could, if, they, if one of these uh, um, bone hunters found it, they can sell it for a lot of money. And so there's always people walking around this area looking for ancient remains. Um, but this is just an example of how much carbon is in this soil. It's a difficult thing to put your, put your head around. Um, but the estimate that scientists have made is that this soil, and this is kind of a cross-section view of what that ice-filled soil looks like at Devon ER and the crumbling towers of, of, uh, that are left as the, as the water melts away, is it's 1,500 billion tons. So it's a difficult number to fathom or to conceptualize how much carbon that is. But to put it in perspective, if you added up the biomass of every above ground tree and shrub, all the plant matter on earth, this is triple the amount of carbon that's stored in this permafrost soil. So it is an absolutely astounding amount of carbon that's trapped in this soil. And the concern that scientists have as this soil is now, is now melting away and, and thawing and, and it's releasing the carbon that was contained in the soil back into the modern ecosystem and in form of you know, these trickling rivers. You can see, you can just looking at the water, you can see how carbon rich it is. It's like a tea that's been brewed um, from the carbon that's in the soil. It's very dark. Um, it's, it's got a lot of particulate matter in it, but also is just, is just is very, is very dark from the amount of dissolved constituents that are in it from the carbon. And um, they've measured um, the carbon that's in this soil or in this modern ecosystem to be about 20,000 years old. And so the analogy that they use, which is a really great one, is that if you take, if you take a steak and you put it in the freezer and then, so the example is 20,000 years later, you're taking that steak out of the freezer and is it still, what scientists are trying to determine is that, is that ancient carbon, is that steak still edible? Uh, because the process of creating the CO2 and methane these, these climate warming gases comes as microbes attack and eat that ancient carbon that's now available to them and they're the process of byproduct of them eating it, they respire CO2 and methane. So it's a feedback loop where as the climate's warming in the Arctic, more of the permafrost is thawing, more of the ancient carbon is getting back into the ecosystem and then modern microbes are jumping right on it. And these are just some of, the, um, some of the experiments that the scientists have been doing up there to um, uh, determine, you know, is this, is this something, how, how fast is this happening, how much does this feedback need to be included into the climate modeling, you know, just how much of a concern is this, because it's a, it's a huge amount of carbon. And of course, it's not going to happen overnight, but what is the rate is the really key question. How much of this permafrost is going to go and how fast? Um, the estimates... Um, that they have right now is that permafrost thaw and the accompanying addition of CO2 and methane to the environment over the years, if we stay at a uh, kind of business as usual amount of warming that we have right now, we'll be like adding another U.S. B amount of carbon emissions to the atmosphere every year. So it's like adding another country with the emissions capability of the U.S. to the atmosphere. It's a kind of a rough example of how much um, is going to be emitted from these areas. So it's a unique experience working in this, working in, in, uh, in thawed permafrost soil. Sergey Zimov, our leader, had this, had this great safety lecture that he gives when we get to the banks of the Coloma River. Um, it's, it's unique in the way he describes how to be safe when we land there. So I thought I'd play this short, short uh, multimedia clip. If you will jump in the slope, it will quickly produce this sledge. And all of this soil will move like lavinas. Do you understand? Yes. Landslide. And you will quickly die. It might be in five seconds. Therefore, don't keep your boots. It's something dangerous. Immediately move like crocodile. <laughs> then you will build the bridge and will take your boots. Don't be modest, it's not so dangerous to be dirty. 
it's most important to be survivor. Do you understand? Yes. yes. Let's go. So that was our first introduction when we got off the small boats in Devani Yar, and of course immediately one of the students found himself up to the knees in this permafrost quicksand, and you quickly came to the conclusion that you had to move very, very fast when you get off the boat because it is basically like running over pudding. And what you're looking for are these little tufts of grasses. If you can find them, that's an area where you can walk and where it's, where it's stable. Um, but it was not just an amazing example of, of, of the, how, how if this environment is, is changing and, and how different it is, actually. And it gives you an appreciation, too, for infrastructure challenges in the Arctic. This is an example of a, of a permafrost core. You know, the scientists of the student-led research. Um, what's unique about the project is that the students who conduct this research, this is Varvara, she was a student from Yakutsk State University in addition to students from the US. We also brought along um, Russian students, um, in this case from the, the next largest city, Yakutsk, which is built on continuous permafrost in, uh, in Siberia. Um, they're studying the whole transformation of permafrost. So from from its state in the ground, taking cores like this, analyzing the cores, and then in the water, so taking water samples from the various tributaries of the large rivers to see um, what was happening inside of these rivers as the carbon transforms, and then also collecting and analyzing the gases that are formed. Um, this was a shot that took me years to make. It became the cover of the book, actually, and this is, this is methane cloud, a cloud of methane coming out of a Siberian lake. Every time you prod the bottom of any one of these lakes with a stick, with your foot, huge clouds of these, of these gases are coming out of, of the water. It's, they're invisible. Um, and uh, this was a shot that I knew that I had to make and say, how do I, I've got the frozen mud picture, but how do we, how do we, how do I communicate kind of the volume, the, the level of just what, you know, how these gases are transforming. And so I had to get in the water. So this is an, you know, the one behind the scenes shot of me working. This is how I got the shot. Um, the first year I went there, I didn't have an underwater housing and I'm looking at these bubbles and I could see the bubbles coming up on top of the lake. And I said, well, this is a pretty boring shot. You can see the bubbles here in the background um, as, I'm, as I'm walking around the lake. And, that's, and you know, the, the professors who were with me, are, this is methane, you know, we could collect it with these little vials and, um, in the water, and I said, okay, next year I'll have to bring a wetsuit and, a, and an underwater housing, and it was still so buggy when I was in the lake that I had to wear the, uh, I had to wear my head net while I was doing this, and spent hours trying to get that perfect shot of the bubbles, because it's, of course, very random as they come up around you. And, um, you know, it, was, it, gave, it gave me an appreciation for how hard it is to work in this environment. You know, this is one of my favorite shots. Um, when I'm communicating science, I like to communicate both kind of some of the successes or results or, you know, not just show the landscapes, but how the scientists do their work, how hard it is to work in these environments. This is Max, you know, one of the lead PIs just covered in permafrost mud. This was in Alaska, so we work with small helicopters um, to take us from field site to field site. And to me, he just has this look that he's totally exhausted, and this is often you know, how it is working in the field in these conditions. Scientists are working their butts off to try to, try to get, these, get these numbers, to feed these models. But it's often something that's overlooked when the news covers it. You know, they'll talk about the model results, talk about projections, but not, you know, there's no time or space to devote to the backstory of how those numbers were made. And so that's really where I see myself as this, this bridge between, um, you know, the results and then how the scientists got them. So I'm a storyteller, um, but I really do focus on, on, on pathways or how, how the scientists got these measurements. I want to finish with a couple of comments about the, about the students. I have this great admiration for these young undergrads who were the core of the Polaris project. And this is Blaise Denfeld. She, she was an undergrad from Clark University. She first came to the Polaris project in 2009. And, uh, and she, she was working with, with river water. And this was, I photographed her again in 2010. She came back and was a mentor for students that were there um, the previous year and has, has now gotten her PhD um, from a university in Sweden and is on her way, I think is doing a postdoc for NASA right now. 
And what's remarkable about this project and, and how it's impacted the students is almost half of the students who have gone through this program have gone on to graduate work in Arctic, Arctic system science. And so to me, that's this amazing example of how the environment of being in that environment of working outside, getting your hands dirty, getting muddy, trying, trying experiments, having them fail, working out how to come to solutions, you know, and the, putting, this, putting this onto the students of them having to come up with their own project transformed so many of them. It was really inspiring to me. And so uh, for a story that often is, you know, it's, it's a difficult one to be optimistic about because of the amount of carbon that, that we're looking at in the Arctic, the implications of that for the future, but the students were, were very inspiring and was a big reason why I continued to go year to year was to uh, interview them, to talk to them about their work and, and, and their enthusiasm actually fed us quite a bit. So the last thing I'll show you is just this quick series of, of uh, interviews I did so you can hear from the students' own voices a couple of comments that they had about how this project changed them. I think for the first time I feel like I actually know what it means to think scientifically just very simply, what's there? <laughs> what do I want to know about it? Because in theory, that's easy to do, and then in practice, it, it took a little work to train myself to think that way. I think the greatest part about this is that it challenges everybody to go out of the comfort zone in some way. Being in the tundra and just knowing that you know, you're the only person doing this, there's literally no other people out here but the people you came with, you know, getting to flesh out your ideas, having it be this huge experiment is just so cool. I think for most of our lives we've just been kind of adding knowledge and now is the point where we take what we know and try to apply it in different ways and create something new. That was just a couple of I think for the first vignettes from from a couple of the students from 2014. These are some stats about, about the Polaris project over the years. Um, there have been 105 undergrads that have gone through the project and resulted in a number of articles and abstracts, but to me the big number is that you know, 50 of them went on to pursue graduate studies. And this is in a place that you know, you know, Russia and in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta in the Arctic that is very hard to get to. And it's an area where basically every new Every measurement you make is a new measurement to science, and it's really, really exciting um, to be along on that ride with them. And it's a real thrill to, um, to be the storyteller uh, that gets to put this all together and kind of use my photographs to tell the story. And uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure. I want to thank you again for coming to the talk. I'm happy to answer questions, to sign books outside. Here's my contact info if people need to, need to contact, contact me or see more of my work um, on social media or on the web. Thanks again. Do you, you want to take your own questions? I think we have about 15 or 20 okay. minutes for questions, so please. Great. Yep. It's interesting, the women you featured, the scientists you featured who were young women, characteristic of the overall group. Yeah, it, it, it changed over time. The Polaris Project initially was a series of professors that got together and they said, okay, we're going to make this project. And they only, they, it was only open to students from specific colleges that the professors were teaching at so that they could give them a month or, or a semester long course before they went to the field. And then in the future, actually, it opened up, they opened it up to everybody, but had a really strong focus on, on underrepresented groups and minorities. So, the project actually became really, really focused on, on underrepresented groups later on in the Polaris project. So and that was another focus thing that Max Holmes really wanted to uh, wanted he wanted to focus on. So it was something that underrepresented in a lot of Arctic or undergraduate research opportunities. I think that because of that feedback loop that you described, that we have already reached the tipping point and we just don't know it. And if not, how close are we to that? Across the measurements are not, are, the measurements are, are, are based on, we've been monitoring temperatures in the permafrost for a long, long time. I think that, you know, I think the estimate that I got 
uh, with the 30 to 70 percent of that permafrost is going to be transformed by 2019. So that depends on projections of how much we can limit the warming until 2100. So that's why there's a range. So in the worst case scenario, 70 percent could be converted. In the better scenario is somewhere around 30. So in terms of the tipping points, I mean it. I think that there's a lot we can still do, and I don't, I don't know if, if, if permafrost is, it was something that's so new that a lot of these results weren't even in the early That's why this became such a hot topic in 2009 and 2010. Russia, Russia is so big. Um, the Siberian Arctic is 10% of Earth's land surface. One out of every ten pieces of land is in the Siberian Arctic. That's how big it is. I mean, it's like eight or nine time zones just across that vast, vast area. And it's all permafrost. So two-thirds of the Arctic is Russia. And there's almost no measurement in that whole huge area. So that was why the project initially was so scary. And that is, it was very, very rich in carbon because that area wasn't glaciated during the last ice age. So where there were these loads of ice that come down, that area was what still drafting. And so there's more carbon than that particular area. Can you reference some uh, changes in infrastructure, some issues that yeah. they were having? But um, as you've spent time in the Arctic, have you seen any changes in the day to day lives? Oh, yeah, yeah. How did that affect them, and, and like, how did you guys sort of interact with that, those changes? Yeah, I've been to a lot of communities. You know, not just Siberia. I mean, Sergey's been there since I think the 70s. Um, himself, and he has a lot of anecdotes. And I've interviewed him extensively about how how that environment has changed. And Greenland too. It's a it's a very very similar story all across the Arctic. I did a project last summer for World Wildlife Fund in Fort Hayden, Alaska, where they had to move their entire village inland due to the erosion. So the Arctic communities are getting hit really hard. And in a way that only one generation ago, we can talk to the elders, their descriptions of environmental change are, are significant. On the order of, on the order of having three months of ice to run sled dog runs to one month. And to me, that's that's a huge change in that short lifespan. So it's 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 happening really really fast right here. Antarctic. So it's not just localized to a specific area. Um, with that, I found where I spent a lot of time. It used to be 5,000 foot dogs. Now there's <coughs> So they're, they're adapting too. They're trying to adapt to these changing conditions. You know, reduction in dogs, more fishing. Fort Hyden now has farm animals, so they have chickens and a cow, and, and that was the focus. They're already well on to, well past, you know, well past like impacts, and now are focused on okay. So where do we put the new town? You know, how many miles inland do we need to be? You know, how many things make up? How many things need to get across? Or things to so already looking well forward to solutions. And yeah, another thing with. Um, Bethel is the town where we operate out of in the Yukon Custom Home Delta. There are a few of you. There are a lot of people from the community who wanted to know what we're doing in Canada or the rest of the state of Colorado. Stories that we could relate to about infrastructure and how they used to be one thing and it doesn't, or 15 years they have to relocate the house or prop up the foundation because the house itself is warm to come across underneath. Chris, thanks for the uh, great stories uh, in the work. Let me know there's an episode on 60 Minutes in the past please. couple of years oh, yeah. about Pleistocene Park. And could you make a comment? What's the status of that? Because it seems like a remarkable effort by Nikita, Sergey, etc. Yeah, so the question was about Pleistocene Park, and there was a, uh, there was a, Max was 
on that as well. He told me that, that they re aired it recently. And and Nikita, they, they're <coughs> actively bringing more and more animals to the park. Nikita has given me an amazing PBS description of them driving a small boat up to Wrangell Island and, and taking muskox from Wrangell and bringing them down to the park. Um, so it's still ongoing. They're, they're, they've been more active than ever, actually, in bringing animals to the park and studying them. And they bring scientists from all over the world in the summer or even in the winter or whatever to, to, make, to make measurements there. So they have really modern stuff as well. It's not just, you know, maintaining the animals in the sand. They also have flux towers where they're measuring carbon and gases coming out of the soil. So they really are studying, okay, so this is what is the scientific value of gasoline and how does it compare to what we can I know that as Sergey, he would love to just change the whole. Correctly, converted uh, to carbon dioxide is a little less effect on the warming. It has a, has a shorter time that spends in the atmosphere, but it's more potent, I guess, than the warming. Great off our, you got any trying to tap the methane and use it locally for. Yeah, I don't know of anything like that. It generally is happening in these wetland kind of marsh areas. What you'll see in the winter too is as the ponds get covered with with ice, methane forms these huge clouds and bubbles underneath. That would probably be the time where you could pop yeah. a hole in the ice. Sergey does this kind of parlor trick where, you know, for reporters and stuff in the news where they'll pick at the hole in the ice and throw a match down there and make the big blue fireball. All winter, they're kind of bubbling up and collecting under the ice. In terms of commercially kind of harvesting that, a lot of time working with restoration or <laughs> yeah, some some days it feels like I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, you know, sitting in the hurricane, but other days it feels like I'm like, wow, you know, it really helps. Every time I'm in the field, I'm, I'm optimistic. Every time I'm with scientists, you know, there's not this feeling of, of dread. It's like, okay, what can we do? Like, what, what can we do? And same thing for being in a community. I feel like they're, they're like, okay, what are we going to do here? Uh, there's always a sense of looking forward as to what, you know, how are we going to transform our community or how are we going uh, to react. And so, to me, being in the field is the best. Being at home to me is the worst. It's being in the field. Is the Cover or what we can do. <laughs> what uh, camera equipment do you use? Holds up in the earth conditions. So right now, camera equipment I use Nikon D850 cameras. They're digital, 45 megapixel digital cameras, and you know, wide range of lenses from wide angle to telephoto. They work really, really well. Even in minus 40 conditions, they hold up better than film cameras ever did, because film can freeze. But the digital cameras, as long as you keep extra batteries you know, close to your body, under your coat, if the batteries freeze in the camera, and that that happens. Frequently, you just pop them out and put in a hot battery, and then it's good for another hour or so. Um, so, yeah. They work really well, actually. Digital cameras work really well. The worst I've seen is, you know, eight hours or so in the field and minus 40, and the LCD will actually start to become a little bit less liquid 
the liquid crystal display on the top will move very slowly and change very slowly. That's when I probably know it's time to quit. Uh, but usually my body's done before the cameras are done. Like after that much time in the field, I can't feel my hands, I can't feel my feet, and it's time to, time to warm up anyway. So the modern cameras, yeah, I'm, I'm amazed. Started this uh, traveling 19 times. Five times on westward in any way. Actually, before that, I heard that there there were carriers in Alaska that were flying routinely to Eastern Russia. It's since then that they don't do that anymore, and now you have to go through Moscow. You have to go through. Nowadays, it's actually a lot easier logistically to fly a flight of Bethel, so they've moved the whole project. Kind of our base of operations is to get to Bethel, Alaska, and then take that R-44 helicopter or float plane out to set up a camping base. It's not quite as comfy as, as the Northeast Science Station in Russia, but, uh, but it's so much easier to get to. Float planes can carry in whole Take one more if anybody's got one. There you go. We'll go to, we'll do two. All right. Is there anywhere yet that you have explored that you're... I will go anywhere in Antarctica you send me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always looking for new stories in Antarctica. That's probably my favorite part of the polar region. And, um, so I'm always pursuing... My next book will be about the Delhi Penguins. It's a little bit more charismatic than the, than the permafrost and permafrost story, but and it's a really different story, but, um, but I, I love Antarctica. It's just such an incredible, epic place. This morning, I was, uh, incidentally, I was telling a couple of people that I was at, there's, there's a, uh, a company here in Public City that's called Antarctica. They're a company that, that supplies the people who hike across Antarctica and stuff like that. They just happen to be a company that's in November. Um, as as the Arctic warms, tree lines advancing into treeless tundra. Permafrost properties. How are scientists studying that? Uh, is there any work to mitigate that? Yeah, that's a huge topic. The greening of the Arctic. Not only that, but even the shrubs. The shrubs. You know, the the willows, the birches, and all this stuff that are in the in the tundra area are getting bigger and more prevalent. So there's a whole mixture of pros and cons to that in terms of, you know, how is that, what's the net result of that? And so I have to, I have to look it up. I don't know off the top of my head what is the, the net result of all that, but it is definitely a very serious uh, topic. And if you, if you look up greening of the Arctic, I'm sure you'll find tons of Other stuff I was reading that the tiger forest was actually going to lose quite a bit of trees. Um, many of these species are, are are adapted to a very niche set of conditions, and so if you get if you get warmer, you're going to get other species moving in. But some of the other ones that are already there are not going to survive very well. Uh, another project I worked on was in the Fraser River in British Columbia, and so they were having massive trees cut off from the bark beetle infestation. Off the forest, that because the beetles weren't being killed off, the winters weren't cold enough. Please join me in thanking Chris for an absolutely. <laughs> our sponsors, the University Credit Union. Thanks so much. That was great. I don't think anybody knows. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So, if you want to go out and find books, yeah. Answer more questions.